We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. Hey, folks, it's Matt Zachary, and welcome to Vax On, a weekly segment of my podcast, Out of Patience, right here on the Offscript Media Network. Hey, I'm Alora Nanos. I'm a lawyer, a journalist, a mom of a teenage narcoleptic, and a professional big mouth. Lou and I go back. 30 years as best friends, and we're here to have fun and bring you a layperson's guide to what the hell just happened this week in healthcare as America gets its vax on and shows COVID the door. Matt gets me. He knows I'm tired, annoyed, and sometimes pushed to the brink by the intense chaos of our lives right now. We're here together to learn, complain, and include you in the conversation. So join us on Twitter at VaxOnPod and share your stories and grievances using the hashtag VaxOn. Conspiracy theorists and haters shall be neutralized on site. All right, Matt, let's get at it. All right, time to zen out because my brain is on fucking overload. I have all terrible news for you in this in this episode. All right, good. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Make my day even even better. I feel like isn't that the way, right? Like you come back from vacation and instead of feeling relaxed, everything is just a total shit show. I mean, I was I was fine last Thursday. This, I guess this is our update. <laughs> I was fine when we got back Thursday, Friday. I got all my shit in a row. And then, of course, Andrew, that fucker, had the nerve to take his vacation this week. So Matt, do not insult Andrew. <laughs> he was here with his fantastic hair and his nice voice. No, no. And he was telling me about the, the horses on Assateague yes, Island. Yes, where he is right now. Yeah, and he's not listening to this, but still, we shouldn't say anything about No, no, about how him. dare he take a vacation and stress me out, right? That's exactly my point. He's the greatest <laughs> thing ever, but come on, please, you got to take it for the team. No more vacations. No more vacations ever again. <laughs> How was your vacation, though? It was fantastic. I had a great time. Once we got there, I'll spare the listeners all the bullshit of getting there and getting home, which is a clusterfuck. Spoiler, never travel internationally during a pandemic. I'll just leave it at that. But once we got there, man, did we have a good time. Turks and Caicos, family vacation, water parks, pools, beaches, scuba, snorkeling, boats, all sorts of crazy shit. Fantastic place to go. What was the highlight of your vacation? The pools. The pools were... They're like because they're like amazing, right? Well, they were like Greco. There's like a an Italian pool. There's a Caribbean oh. pool. There's a French pool. It's Ep- oh. Epcot ish in that sense, but the ocean was like eighty five. The ocean felt like a hot tub. It was fantastic. You can't beat tropical ocean. It's just it's just not like anything else. No, and it was clear. Like hello, Brighton yeah. Beach. No, the water was clear. Did your kids go crazy when they saw the ocean? They had so much fun. I mean, this was their yeah. first international trip, but they had a just a fabulous day. Even the food, the local food. We rented um, dune buggies and toured the islands. Went to this. Oh, aren't you adventurous? Totally local. Like conch is like the seafood of the the main export is conch. Right. And and did you read Lord of the Flies? Well, oh <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ! <laughs> no, I did not. But overall, <laughs> highly recommended. Three years since we had a family vacation, and what a better way to congratulate their fifth grade graduation, to have summer vacation, and to welcome the end of COVID-ish as we know it, minus the fact that just getting there and dealing with all the COVID vaccine testing, tourism, passport shit, fucking nightmare, don't travel internationally during a pandemic. Or go someplace where they just don't care. Like I went to the Dominican Republic and nobody asked me for a damn thing. You know what? Better solution. (laughs) Go someplace where they just don't give a shit about you or anyone else. 
They're like, listen, we survive on tourism and we're not going to ask any questions. If your country wants its COVID test before you go back, that's their problem. But as far as we're concerned, as long as your money's green, you're healthy. Yes. So what what Allura said, let's just work with that. So, I mean, that's certainly much better than my update because- But um, you got your fridge. I saw your kitchen's done, right? Or almost done? It's not done. I have a refrigerator, but I don't have a sink or a stovetop. But, you know, little by little. But, you know, I've spent the last week just being sick. So I have a sinus infection, which is, you know, really fun, especially during a pandemic when you know you don't have the virus, but you're still sick and now you can't do anything because God forbid it's COVID. You mean like a regular normal thing people get every now and then? Right. And I'm kind of really fucking annoyed that I have it because who am I ever even around? Like I'm even though COVID is really managed in a lot of ways, I'm not really around lots of people indoors. I mean, I spend the majority of my time outdoors. So it annoys me that I contracted anything. Right. But you just spent the last 18 months like in a bank vault with no nothing bothering your immune system. Like you're like immunocompromised. Everyone's immunocompromised. I guess so. Now I'm like a baby. Like you can't, I can't go near anything or I'm going to immediately. We've been bacterialist for 18 months. So our body's like, what is all this? Oh, well, my body was not happy. And now I have a sinus infection and I decided to be a good girl and go to the doctor to make sure that it didn't progress. And now I had to get a COVID test and like, and and the doctor's like, I know you don't have COVID. You know, you don't have COVID. We still have to do a COVID test and you have to stay inside till the results come back. And I'm like, really? The whole thing is so annoying to me, but you know, it is what it is. So I have a sinus infection. I'm really pissed off about it. And that's my update. And as you can, the the one thing I'll say though, is that this is the first time I've ever recorded a podcast while I have a sinus infection. And it's not lost on me that my voice is probably an entire octave lower than it usually (laughs) is. You're doing basso this time. Yeah. Which is like, that's what you're supposed to do. You know, when you, when you do media, you're supposed to like purposely lower your voice because I, I guess that's somehow more palatable to people. And I never do because I'm always so excited that I just cannot modulate myself. I can't even be inauthentic, even voice range wise. But yeah, so I sound, um, you know, much more, I guess, serious and alto as opposed to my usual soprano self. Well, uh, well done, immunocompromised (laughs) biology. But yeah, so I'm annoyed. To compliment my, my annoyance is like we have all these stories today and they're annoying. And I'm not going to lie, like these are annoying COVID stories. I mean, the whole point of the show is healthcare fuckery, right? It can't be like healthcare nicety. Right, right. We don't want any of that nice shit. Be forewarned and forearmed. I am here to complain about things today. Well, I'm right there with you. Okay, good. In my Caribbean withdrawal. And speaking of summertime delights, shall I tell you what's going on in Texas? So this is not about Florida for once. No, it's about Texas. And it's about a big church in Texas that had summer camp. I mean, summer camp sounds innocent enough. Famous last words. I mean, I guess. Although, I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of sleepaway summer camp for kids in the middle of a fucking pandemic. Yeah, I'll agree with that. I mean, I realize that things are getting better. I totally realize that. And I am in no means advocating that people shut themselves in the house and do nothing. I just feel like on the ends of the spectrum are, you know, on one hand, staying in lockdown in your living room. And the other end is sending your fucking kids to sleepaway camp where you have no control over what's going on and you can't even talk to them on the phone and who the hell knows what they're doing. Right. On a good day. So, pandemic list. On a good day. Way. Right. Like, I- I'm not a huge fan of sleepaway summer camp to begin with, but in this context, it seems insane to me. And, you know, what happened was 400 kids go to this summer camp in Texas, kids age sixth grade through 12th grade. So these are kids that are largely vaccination age. And guess what? A quarter of them came down with COVID. And then they came back from camp. So they got COVID, they stayed at camp, then they came back from camp and infected all their families. But of course, this is like Texas where no one got vaccinated anyway. You know, I tried to find out, like, did this particular summer camp or the church that runs the camp, did did they cop to being anti-vax or or having vaccination protocols or whatever. And and their statement was like, oh, from the beginning of the pandemic, we've been practicing strict safety protocols. But who the hell knows what that means? If they were so strict about it, they would have probably all been vaccinated. And there's no way that a quarter of them would have gotten sick. So, I mean, it's very sad. Is it fair to be a cockeyed optimist, which I rarely am, and say- You're a cockeyed optimist? Just for this one moment. <laughs> all right. One moment. I get one in my one. lifetime. I'm, I'm picking it now. I'm throwing down my hand. (laughs) Is COVID still a death sentence like it used to be 
Or are we at a point now where the mortality of it is just so low across the board? Is it fair to say that? Where who cares that people are getting COVID, whether they're vaxxed or not, because they're probably not going to go to the hospital or they're probably not going to die. Is it apathetic or I'm being insensitive? What are your thoughts? Well, I don't think you're being insensitive, but I'll say this. I'm not at who cares yet. I'm kind of at, okay, I'm not going to have a panic attack over it because the the overwhelming odds are that these people will be fine. So, you know, it, it is certainly not a death sentence. In fact, it's actually never been a death sentence to have COVID. There are people who died, but certainly it was never that everyone who got it died. And the numbers are much lower. So yeah, it's not, I don't think it's something that we should say, oh, well, you know, these people got COVID and it's the same as getting some other, you know, fatal disease. At the same time, I'm not really ready to say who cares, it's not a big deal. Because there are still people who are unvaccinated. There are still immunocompromised people and people who have risk factors that if they get it, they certainly could die or they could get very sick or they could have long-term effects that we don't know about yet. I think that 125 people at a summer camp of 400 people getting COVID, I think it's a big problem. You know, it it could be worse. You know, it could have happened a year ago, but I still think it sucks. Yeah, I I still understand the whole you can spread it to people that are vulnerable who are unwitting. But I would also contend that most people who are vulnerable probably were woke enough to get the vaccine. I mean, it depends. People, and we'll talk later about some reasons why people have held off on getting the vaccine in some cases. You know, I mean, I think you're right. I think that certainly things have changed. But I have to tell you that that seeing this and seeing, you know, you're talking 25% of the people that went to this camp, that's a lot. And I, I just don't like seeing that level of spread of any virus, particularly one that we have all been on such high alert for for so long. Like somebody fucked up. And whether whether the fuck up was They didn't require vaccinations and nobody cared about it or that they did require it and no one checked it or that they everybody was vaccinated, but they just had terrible safety protocols. I don't know what it is, but either way, I don't like it. I mean, I'm still moving into this apathetic stage after nearly 20 months of this bullshit where if you're vaccine hesitant and again, we're going to get to that. And I'm I'm sensitive to what we're going to be speaking about in the second half of the show. But when do we just say it's your fault and not mine anymore? I'm just going to be a lawyer for a second. Go ahead. And and I'll say this. Ascribing fault to something is a completely separate topic than feeling bad. So just because something might be someone's fault, it doesn't mean that we don't care or don't want it to happen. Um, Andrew and I actually, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week where he reminded me that people who are unvaccinated, even for really stupid reasons, you know, are still people. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> we probably don't want them to get hurt. And I listened to the show, and by the way, kudos to the two of you for doing a stellar job. But thank you, thank you. I acknowledge these are people. I don't want anyone to get sick. I don't want anyone to go to the hospital. I am not in favor. I'm not pro suffer. Okay, I'll just as if that needed to be even said. I'm not pro suffer. Right. <laughs> you know, l- let's just get that out of the way. No pro suffer conversations here on the show in general at all. But again, I'm really leaning towards this like deeply disturbed space where I'm kind of ad-libbing this stat, but I I read it somewhere and I'll find a source somewhere that at this point, from a pediatric perspective, from an 18 and under perspective, something like you're 30,000% more likely to get leukemia than have anything bad happen to you from COVID if you're under 18. And there's unicorns. Of course, there's unicorns. And and there's always going to be unicorns, no matter what it is. But if you are going to be a vector to the unvaccinated, that's a separate conversation that we'll talk about in the second half of the show. Right. But I I think that is an important point. And, And it's something that people who have been very kind of COVID safe, people who have been very pro vaccination from the beginning, sometimes do fall into this trap of sort of overestimating what the statistics actually are. And I think that that is an important point to keep it in perspective, that while this is absolutely a concern and we have to do everything we can for it, you know, compared to other risks, it's, it, it is not as bad. But it is a risk we can also mitigate. So when we can mitigate it, we might as well do that. So I think there's a lot that goes on to our own personal perception of risk and what it means to us. Either way, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed that 25% of these people at this freaking summer camp got COVID. It just seemed avoidable and they should have done something about it. What they should have done, I don't know. Hopefully they're all fine, but they still shouldn't have come down with it in those numbers. (laughs) 
so as maniacally upsetting, disturbing, and depressing as that story was, what else you got for me? If you thought you could be apathetic on the camp story, just wait, because there is no way you're going to be apathetic about this crazy freaking story. Do you have any idea what has been going on in India? Yeah, we talked about that on the show. It's been a, a, a catastrophe for months and months. Yes. And, you know, mild good news, things are getting better. Uh, about four and a half percent of the population has now been fully vaccinated and more every day. So that's great. But during this time where vaccines were difficult to come by and the country was just overrun with COVID-19, there was a wide ranging scam going on. And get this, this is like unbelievable to me. Doctors and medical workers who were associated and worked in hospitals created this huge scam where they tricked people into getting fake COVID vaccines. What? Yeah. 2,500 people paid for fake COVID shots that were really just saline. I mean, this was through a hospital and the hospital was printing up certificates and they were making syringes and these people were getting fake vaccines. And- 2,500 people got them. The people who perpetrated the fraud earned $28,000, and now there are all kinds of arrests going on. So far, 14 people have been arrested, and we'll see if there's more to come. Um, but how crazy is that? I mean, my first inclination is to ask, why are they paying for the vaccine? Shouldn't it be free in every country? I ask innocently. That is precisely what I asked our fearless producer. Why Wouldn't these people have been a little sketched out by the fact that they were being asked to pay when typically it would have been free. And it's not like in the US where, you know, everybody's got different health insurance and who the hell knows what your insurance covers. India has national health care. You know, Indian people are not used to paying out of pocket for medical costs. So that should have tipped them off. But my understanding is that the way that it worked is that if you remember, you know, the vaccines were really hard to come by. So the doctors were essentially saying to these these people, well, we, we ran out of COVID vaccine, but if you pay me some money, and it looks like it's about you know ten dollars a person, if you pay me some money, I can get you one. So I, you know, so they knew that they were doing something shady, but they thought that what they were doing was just buying into a supply of COVID vaccine that wasn't widely available. In reality, they were buying into complete bullshit. Yeah, I, I, I'm now I'm trying to envision what that was like to go to this place and like they probably have the vials and they're clear and you just get saline and no one asks questions. But I mean, not to be too dark here, but at least it wasn't like, I don't know, like orange juice or something that really could have hurt them. Right. It, it was saline. It, it does not sound like anyone got hurt from it. Thank goodness. Um, I'm sure some people contracted COVID thinking that they were, you know, perfectly safe. I'm sure that happened. But how, I mean, that is crazy. And it's a really wide scale fraud because it was at multiple locations around Mumbai. Like I said, 2,500 people were victims of this scam. That's a big deal. And the people who were involved were medical professionals. Look, there's bad apples everywhere. And bell curve, yeah, there's some fucking horrible people that would do horrible shit just to make a buck under any circumstance. And this is really unfortunate. And it does make me really angry. It makes me really angry. And, you know, I, I will say that during the pandemic, you know, we've talked about this before, Matt, you know, there was in, in many ways really a feeling that the whole world was in this together and that the world was a bit of a smaller place. And, you know, I remember looking to see what's going to happen in Italy and what's going to happen in China, and what's happening in other countries. And this really breaks my heart to know that, you know, especially during a time that we were all gleefully getting vaccinated and, you know, millions of people a day getting vaccinated. And here, the people in India, things are already terrible because there are tons of people and not enough vaccines. And then people are taking advantage of that situation and profiting from, you know, just people not knowing better. Um, it just is terrible. So I watched Independence Day, the movie from 1996 this past week, and because it was Independence Day, <laughs> when the aliens came and united the world. So now I'm thinking, like, who was scamming the Americans or who was scamming other human beings? Hey, hey, for 10 bucks, I can get you out of the alien abduction. Yeah, and you know somebody will be doing yes. that, right? But also the thing is, I think it's difficult to draw the line because my experience, and, and this is such a Staten Island experience, and so I know you're in this with me, Matt. But no matter what bad shit was going down, there was always some way that if you just knew a guy 
and you just paid the guy, it wouldn't affect you as much. Yeah, that back of the truck vaccine works really well, I hear. Right. Like it's like Cabbage Patch Kids. Like no one can get them, but like, hey, I know a guy and Cousin Vinny told me that there's a guy and I pay him and I get a hot one, which is like exactly how I got my Cabbage Patch Kid. Did you really? <laughs> oh my God. Totally the Staten Island way. I wish I knew someone that worked at Keldor who would have told me when the supply chain came in. <laughs> yes. But I mean, who knows if these were even legit Cabbage Patch Kids? They were probably like Schmabbage Patch Kids. <laughs> Cabbage Patch Kids. <laughs> <laughs> right, they were totally common. <laughs> you know, it's funny because, you know, growing up in Staten Island, that mentality is so much part of the culture that you don't even realize it. And then when you get out of it, you kind of, I, I always look back and say, oh, that was kind of weird that I always thought that there was some kind of shady way to get whatever it is I needed. I don't have those kind of connections, I guess, anymore. So I I really am curious from a sort of sociological standpoint in India, was this something that was commonplace that because you have a huge population, uh, any important resources are probably always limited and are people used to saying, oh, I could get it like on the black market? Or was this really unusual because it was a pandemic and the vaccine for COVID? Like, I, I just wonder how that went about. Well, Cabbage Patch, Cabbage Patch, Schmabbage Patch, now it's time for some ads. (laughs) Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Well, we're back and just realized that we're both as concurrently know it as possible after those two stories. But I brought this one to the conversation for once. It was my idea because I was really curious. Like we alluded to this in the first half of the show. Turns out many people are hesitant to get the vaccine because of something I never could have predicted. They're waiting for full FDA approval and not emergency use authorization approval. That's a thing. You feel like you could, I could totally have predicted that. I literally just totally, I'm like, EUA is pretty good. And I was also reading in the same article that after about two months of distribution, if there are no major side effects, there are no major side effects. Yeah, I read that too. And which really made me feel so good about the kids that are getting vaccinated now, because you're not rational when you're doing stuff with your kids, right? And it it definitely helps me to say, yeah, that, that makes sense. If there were going to be side effects, we would have seen them already. But, you know, Matt, I, I have to tell you, a lot of people that I have talked to during the course of this pandemic who who are vaccine hesitant have told me that the reason that they don't like it is because they believe the FDA rushed the approval and that they don't like the emergency approval. Um, that has been a major talking point among people that have told me that they're either not getting the vaccine or not getting the vaccine yet. I mean, kudos to those people for being aware of public health, first and foremost. But at the same time, It's been, what, six months, eight months since the first use in February went wide and there's 200 million Americans that are vaccinated. What more do you Uh, need to be convinced other than just some rubber stamp from the FDA? Well, let me just let me just back up for a second. I'm not sure I'm giving any kudos to anybody because I just think that this whole, oh, it's an emergency approval only thing is just a talking point. These people have absolutely no idea nor do I, what normally goes into FDA approval, whether the other medications they take have been FDA approved, whether anything they take has been emergency approved. Nobody knows what's going on there. Unless you're in the medical industry, people aren't paying attention to that shit. It just sounds like a good talking point. Well, I'd say go into your medicine cabinet and find all the shit that has not been approved by the FDA that you shove in your pie hole every day. Exactly. And you know what else, Matt? You know, you live in that cancer world. And I know that many people I have heard over the last many years, talking about experimental cancer treatments or new cancer treatments that emerge, I have many times heard people sort of brag that they are working with a doctor 
to combat cancer. And, you know, oh, well, we have this new treatment and it's not FDA approved yet, but it's so fantastic and I'm going to do it because, uh, you know, it's the latest thing and it's the newest thing and it's going to be great. I I have never heard someone prior to COVID say that they're going to not do something that is hopeful for their own medical condition because it only has emergency approval. We've moved from a time where trials, clinical trials and precision medicine were boogeymen. You don't want to be a guinea pig, right? Who wants to be a guinea right. pig? But you're not guinea pigs. And we've gotten really woke in the sense of a growing majority of patients who are completely amenable to what used to be called experimental therapy and are now precision medicine strategies, like targeted therapies that have not been FDA approved or in you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. We're thrilled. There's a bragging rights happening now in many markets and many disease states right. to be on these, these trials. Right. And what I'm hearing in other arenas, apart from COVID-19, I've always heard people say um, that they're frustrated with the FDA for not moving faster, that they know that this treatment is so fantastic and they wish the FDA would just hurry up and approve it um, and complaining about red tape and things like that. And now you have the FDA actually responding because it's such a serious uh, widespread threat and nobody likes that either. Well, I'm reading here that a Kaiser Family Foundation survey in May found that a third of unvaxxed Americans say they'd be more likely to get the shot once it was fully approved. But do we really know what that means? I have to tell you, I don't believe that statistic. I believe that that statistic shows that people said that. And I bet you that of those people, when it gets full approval, they're going to find another reason why they don't want to get it. That that's sort of a reason that sounds good and satisfies whoever they're talking to, um, to blame it on the fact that it was emergency approval. And then when it comes down to it, those same people are going to say, well, I still don't like the way the FDA did it. Well, what sparked this entire conversation for me was Eric Topol. Eric Topol is a luminary in the space. He's a huge leader. He's been doing this work for many, many years. And he's the guy that started talking about, how do we nudge the FDA? Hey, psst. Guys, what are you waiting on? What's going on? It's been eight months since this was EUA approved. What are you waiting for? What's it going to take? But I have a question, though, and maybe you know the answer to this. How the hell long does it take the FDA to approve a drug? Is it totally different for all different kinds of drugs? Or is it like there's like a standard kind of amount of time that it usually will take? It really depends because it goes back to enrollment in trials and studies. Like everything has to go from phase one to phase two to phase three. And then there's an entirely redonkulous process to get the FDA to look at the data, study the data, and pre-approve it, and then approve it. It could take three years in many cases, depending on the treatment. But this is an mRNA virus that was built on mRNA technology for the last decade. And it's already been in the public space as EUA for eight months. Millions of people have had this. It's unique in the annals of FDA Fast Track, which is a version of EUA that isn't EUA. So tell me if I'm wrong about this, because I feel that the FDA should at least be able to sort of predict when they think it's coming, or even if it's not a timeline, what steps would have to be accomplished in order to get full approval. And I don't like that they're not doing that, and I want to know why they're not doing that. Yeah, as do I, as does Eric. Like This is an open-ended conversation that just got sparked last week. What are they waiting for? At least give us open communications as to your process. Because honestly, fuck all the people that say that I'm going to do it if it's approved, regardless if even a percentage of those people do it when it's approved. When can we say it's going to be officially fully FDA approved? All of them. Right. I mean, it seems like I imagine that the FDA is not like making this shit up as they go along. I'm sure they have some set of systems and protocols that they're going to use for this medication for other medications. So like, why can't they tell us what the rules are? I don't understand. They don't have to tell us even when, you know, the vaccine is going to pass whatever those milestones are, but why can't they just tell us what they are? This is very, as a lawyer, this is insanely frustrating to me. Right, And again, just to quote Eric Topol, here's his actual Twitter quote. This is a global crisis. We're starting to head into another phase that's not good. I think it's irresponsible that the FDA has not made even a public statement giving us a timeline for full approval, end quote. Oh, so apparently Eric Tobel and I should go and have a cup of coffee so that we can complain about this together. You totally should follow him. He's an amazing guy, huge influencer, luminary, friend of mine, just great, great, great guy. And if you want, like, not fake news bullshit, you follow Eric Tobel, his gospel.
Well, excellent. I will. I, and I'm honestly, I thought when I raised this point, I thought you were going to tell me, oh, you don't know. This is like always how it's done and, and it's okay for these reasons. And I, I feel like this is bullshit. I want to know what the rules are. I want to know what they expect. I'm sh- they're smart people over there at the FDA. They should be able to stand by whatever their guidelines are and no one should feel like they're making it up as they go along and they need to tell us and be transparent about it. So I, I'm actually... Um, surprised, but also I feel validated that like, oh, okay, I didn't know that this was a conversation going on out there that other people are pissed off about this too. So great. Now we're all pissed off. FDA, get your shit together. Yeah. And I can't speak to immunology versus oncology approval phases. That's apples to oranges. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, we're all fruit. It's different. It's completely different lanes. You know, if, if an oncology drug shows incredible promise, they'll fast track it for approval. But the data has to suggest that like nine out of 10 people are cured after an hour of being on the drug. Like it's really impossible right. to have that kind of data. But breakthroughs are really happening that accelerate approval. We have here a vaccination product that has already proven meritable at massive global scale. So I don't know what it takes. Well, I can, there's no phase four. There's phase three in approval. Well, I can phase three and a half. What are they waiting for? I just want, to Eric's point, to hear what they have to say. Right. Because, I mean, maybe they have a perfectly good reason. I- I'm totally open to hearing it. I just want to hear it. I want to hear something. Because to say like, oh, you know, pay no attention to the FDA and what they're doing. Just, you know, base your, put your trust in them but we're not really going to tell you why. I mean, th- that's not appropriate to me for any kind of government agency and certainly not something like this that is of the utmost importance that affects the entire planet. I mean, I realize the FDA doesn't control the whole planet, but what we do here in the US has many ripple effects. And I think if the vaccine and its approval is a critical piece for so many people, like it, it has to be done right. And doing it right means telling people what the rules are, what the timeline is, what the expectations are, and being transparent about it. So let's get hashtag Dear FDA trending on Twitter, says me. <laughs> and you know what? I hope the listeners have really enjoyed our collective disdain for progress in society. This is a particularly, <laughs> I would say, cockeyed pessimist, as much as I tried to be <laughs> cockeyed optimist for just a mere moment. Really great episode of the show. And we hope to have better news for you next week. Maybe. Who knows? Can we be optimistic? We could be, but I might just be here to complain more. Fantastic. Well, it depends on how my sign is as well. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to send you uh, prayers for less germs, although germs, yes. are, we got to bring germs back. Germs are valuable to human existence. And again, I don't want people to get sick, sick, but we kind of need germs and dirt, don't we? I mean, I'm all for germs and dirt. I'm living on a construction site covered with sawdust. So yeah, I'm all for the dirt. All right. We are pro (laughs) germs and dirt. And on that note, this concludes another exciting episode of Vaxxon. See you next week, folks. Bye-bye. That's all for today, folks. If you like today's show, the conversation continues on Twitter at VaxxonPod. That's V-A-X-O-N pod. Be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and tell all your friends to listen. Vaxxon is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Alora Nanos. Our senior producers are Brianna Seely and Andrew McDowell. It is mixed and edited by Brianna Seely. Our theme music is by Chair Model. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com.